We'll go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 107 this morning. Psalm 107. And uh, those of you that have attended Lakeside for uh, some time now, you know that we used to have a Thanksgiving Eve communion service. Um, We did that for many years and uh, was really a highlight for many of us. And it seemed to become more lightly attended uh, over the years, and, it, and we realized it was probably conflicting with people preparing for Thanksgiving and hosting family and friends um, or traveling, people being out of town. And so uh, I've resorted to usually doing a after Thanksgiving uh, reminder of the priority of gratitude and what an important um, quality that is for us as Christians. It's something that's part of our vision statement here at Lakeside is we want to make sure that we're cultivating an attitude of gratitude, that we have grateful people. In other words, grateful people don't fuss and complain a whole lot. So that's, okay, it's self-serving. We want you to be grateful uh, so that you don't complain about stuff. <laughs> so, uh, but that's a good thing, right? God calls us to be grateful and uh, it's, it's a high priority in the text of Scripture, and so um, I just look, I look forward to an annual opportunity just to remind us of, of the, the, the high premium that God places on this characteristic of, of thankfulness. And so I thought rather than doing it after Thanksgiving this year, why not do it before Thanksgiving? And so I'd like to look with you this morning at Psalm 107, a familiar psalm I imagine for most of you, uh, but if this is your first time walking through it, uh, you are in for a treat. Let's go ahead and read it together in its entirety uh, because it is really powerful uh, kind of to see the big picture uh, of, of this psalm before we get uh, into uh, the verse by verse explanation of it. Psalm 107 verse 1, oh give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary and gathered from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desert region. They did not find a way to an inhabited city. They were hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them out of their distresses. He led them also by a straight way to go to an inhabited city. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men, for he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. There were those who dwelt in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in misery and chains because they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he humbled their heart with labor. They stumbled and there was none to help Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their bonds apart. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men, for he has shattered gates of bronze and cut bars of iron asunder. Fools, because of their rebellious way and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all kinds of food and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them also offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his works with joyful singing. Those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they have seen the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he spoke and raised up a stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They rose up to the heavens, they went down to the depths, their soul melted away in their misery. They reeled and staggered like a drunken man and were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distresses. He caused the storm to be still, so that the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they were quiet, so he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and his wonders to the sons of men. Let them extol him also in the congregation of the people and praise him at the seat of the elders. 
He changes rivers into a wilderness and springs of water into a thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salt waste because of the wickedness of those who dwell in it. He changes a wilderness into a pool of water and a dry land into springs of water. And there he makes the hungry to dwell so that they may establish an inhabited city and sow fields and plant vineyards and gather a fruitful harvest. Also he blesses them and they multiply greatly and he does not let their cattle decrease. When they were diminished and bowed down through oppression, misery, and sorrow, he pours contempt upon princes and makes them wander in a pathless waste. But he sets the needy securely on high, away from affliction, and makes his families like a flock. The upright see and are glad, but all unrighteousness shuts its mouth. Who is wise? Let him give heed to these things and consider the loving kindnesses of the Lord. Father, we thank you for this opportunity today as we head into Thanksgiving week to consider your great love for us in Christ. This psalm is a great reminder to us of how you have mercifully, graciously delivered us from our life of sin and saved us through your son, Jesus Christ. And so I pray that you would use this psalm in our lives in the same way you intended it to be used in the lives of the Israelites when they sang it, that we would be stirred up and stimulated as those you have redeemed to sing forth joyful praise and thanksgiving to you. You are so worthy of it. Forgive us for not being more vocal about your goodness and your love for us. And I pray that this psalm would Um, encourage us and and stimulate us um, to greater praise and thanksgiving. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, some years ago, I read a, I can't think of a better word to describe it than a profane article written at Thanksgiving time entitled, Thanks But No Thanks. Thanks. And it was about how some Christians were expressing concern that Thanksgiving was becoming more and more secularized by our society, just like Christmas has become. And the article itself was proof of that because the author chided Christians who insist the focus uh, should be on Christ during Christmas time for also wanting to celebrate Thanksgiving with an emphasis on thanking God. In fact, the article included a picture of a turkey choking on a cross. The author suggested that the traditional story that we we all learned in, in grade school about the pious pilgrims thanking God for graciously bringing them to America and sustaining them during that difficult first year was really a, it's a heartwarming story, but its historical accuracy is in question. And so consequently, Christians should not try to impose a spiritual meaning to thanksgiving. And the article closed by proposing that rather than insisting that people thank God, Christians should let everyone celebrate thanksgiving however they deem best, even if it means they thank goodness, not God. Which, in the author's mind, after all, is close enough. Well, as the saying goes close but no cigar, because just thanking goodness will not suffice in light of the fact that God is good and everything that is good comes from God. James 1.17 makes that clear. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. And no one understood and appreciated God's goodness better than the pilgrims who, if you know anything about church history, were actually Puritans from England who came to America seeking refuge from persecution. 
And again, you may not know that or not have not known that because revisionist thinkers have sought to remove the role that God and the Bible have played in the founding of our country. In fact, I was talking to someone after first service and they said their wife teaches in the public school and she was this last week given this lesson about the pilgrims. And uh, the way the lesson read was that that the pure, or the, excuse me, the pilgrims were thankful, expressing thanks to the Indians. And uh, she stopped the class and said, now kids, this is what our lesson says. They were, they were thankful for the Indians, but they were giving thanks to God. And uh, she said, uh, I might get fired <laughs> for saying that or telling that to you guys, but that's the truth. And so I want you to know this morning that the pilgrim story is not a myth. It's, it's, it's not um, something that was made up. Um, and, and to prove that, I want to read for you the true historical account of the pilgrims uh, in the words of Governor William Bradford's book called On Plymouth Plantation. William Bradford was, of course, the leader of the Puritans that came over, and he was the first governor of the first colony in Massachusetts. And this is how the story goes. In September of 1620, a small wooden ship called the Mayflower set sail from England, headed for the New World. Crowded on board were 102 English Puritans who had been persecuted, imprisoned, and dispossessed of their homes and believed that God was leading them to establish a new community where they could worship freely. After 65 days of tossing on the sea through ferocious storms, seasickness, terrible food, and no sanitation, these pilgrims reached the shores of what is now known as Plymouth, Massachusetts. Winter was setting in, and they quickly constructed rustic shelters for themselves. However, as the weeks went by, the weather grew worse. In the coldest stretch of winter, a flu-like illness swept through the Plymouth colony. By the end of March, nearly half of those who had arrived on the Mayflower had died. With the help of two English-speaking Indians, Samoset and Squanto, the remaining colonists formed a peace pact with a nearby Wampanoag tribe who taught the settlers how to grow crops such as corn and pumpkins and how to trap beavers for their pelts. By October 1621, the crops were ready for harvest. The pilgrims' hearts were full of gratitude to God for their renewed health, for their abundant harvest, and for the peace they enjoyed with the Indians. It was William Bradford who declared that they should hold a festival of thanksgiving. Before the feast, Bradford offered a prayer of thanks to God for his miraculous provision and protection in helping them establish the first permanent settlement in North America. And what is striking about that account on Plymouth uh, Plantation is that Bradford quotes Psalm 107. And it was obviously a favorite psalm of the Puritans who likely meditated on this psalm during their perilous journey uh, to America on that rickety old ship and during that difficult first year. And so it's no wonder that it became known as the Pilgrim's Psalm. The Pilgrim's Psalm. I asked uh, them to keep our first Peter slide up today, even though we're taking a break this morning from our study of first Peter, because it's a pocket guide for pilgrims. And what you can't see there in that line of pilgrims who are making their trek to heaven is that their mouths are moving and they're singing and they're praising and worshiping God. At least we can imagine that that's what they're doing. That's what they should be doing. That's what we should be doing, right? As pilgrims uh, who, who know this is not our home, but we have been saved out of this world. We've been redeemed by the Lord. And uh, as we walk towards our heavenly home, uh, we are singing and rejoicing and giving thanks to the Lord. And so this psalm really should be very familiar to us as Christian pilgrims, um, as we're learning about in 1 Peter. Uh, this, hopefully this psalm will become very near and dear to your heart and really inform you and give you expression for your praise and your thanksgiving um, as you uh, live as an alien and stranger, as a pilgrim here uh, on this earth. Well, let's look at this psalm a little more closely. This psalm originally was written to the nation of Israel, specifically to help them celebrate their return from exile in Babylon. It's very important that we understand the historical context of why this psalm was written. 
Um, as you know, God had chosen the nation of Israel to be a witness to all the other nations of the world that he was the one and only true God. And this required that they be different from the other nations. And so God gave them very specific commands uh, for them to follow, that, they would, that, that would keep them set apart from the rest of the world, how they dress, how they eat, how they worship. People were to look at them and go, wow, you're really strange. You're really different. You're not like us. However, the nation of Israel, as you know, rebelled against God. They didn't keep his commands. They didn't remain separate from the nations around him. And so he punished them by sending those nations to conquer them, the Babylonians being one of them. And so God sent the Babylonians to destroy the the promised land and to remove them from the land and take them to Babylon. And while they were in captivity... The Israelites acknowledged their sin and their rebellion. They cried out to God to deliver them, and God heard their cry, and in his goodness and love, he allowed them to return to their homeland. And so after they got back to their country, these repentant pilgrims had the opportunity to thank God for his goodness and his loving kindness in delivering them from the dreadful, uh, disastrous situation in which they had been. And so I believe the writer's intent was to stimulate and motivate them through the words of the psalm to express their gratitude to God for his wonderful acts of goodness and love. In fact, this is the repeated theme of this psalm, verse one, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Verse eight, let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness. Verse 15, let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness. Verse 31, let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness. Verse 43, and consider the loving kindness of the Lord. So this psalm, this song is that, that God wanted Israel to sing, again, as a response to his uh, merciful redemption of them from exile, uh, is all about celebrating and thanking God for his loving kindness. And so I've broken this psalm up into three sections that will follow in our outline this morning. Number one, uh, we see in verses one through three, Uh, praise for God's loving kindness. In verses 4 through 32, we see profiles of God's loving kindness. And then finally, in verses 33 through 43, we'll see proof of God's loving kindness. So let's look first of all at praise for God's loving kindness in verses 1 through 3. Notice he tells us what he wants us to do right off the bat. He says, oh, give thanks to the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. We are to express our gratitude to God. We are to let God know how thankful we are for how good he has been to us. In other words, we cannot be silent. We need to rise up and we need to proclaim and sing and speak of God's goodness. And really, this is this opening line ties this psalm together with the previous two psalms, Psalm 105 and Psalm 106. They both start with the same verse, oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. That's Psalm 105, verse one. Psalm 106, verse one, praise the Lord, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. And then, of course, Psalm 107, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. This is a, a really a trilogy uh, recounting Israel's history and their rebellion against the Lord and how God restored them. Um, to a right relationship with him. So we are to give thanks. Why? It says, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. That word for loving kindness there is the Hebrew word hesed, as they say it. And, and this is really the primary word, the, the, the premier word uh, in the Old Testament to describe God's love. And, and it's really the word uh, to describe his steadfast covenant-keeping love. That's why some of you who have an ESV, uh, it says, uh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And so that's uh, a specific translation of this word hesed, steadfast love, this covenant-keeping love. He has made a promise uh, to love you, and he will never break that 
promise. In other words, he never stops loving us no matter what we do. His love stands the test of time. It will last throughout all eternity. Listen, beloved, God's love, and I call you beloved because you're not just beloved to me, you're beloved to God. Because God's love for you is unchanging. It's unfailing. It's unending. It's unrelenting. It's undying. That's how much God loves you. Who is he referring to here? Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Who should be giving thanks for God's goodness and loving kindness? It's those who have been redeemed. Verse 2, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary and gathered from the lands, from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. So that term redeemed is, it was used to describe those who had been rescued or, or delivered from an enemy or some kind of troubling situation. In this context, obviously, it's the Babylonians and Babylonian captivity. But we know this concept of redemption is used throughout uh, the Old Testament and even spills over in the New Testament. Uh, this was an integral concept Uh, to the Jewish culture, if a family member was in trouble, they found themselves in some kind of distressing situation, they were in debt, uh, they were enslaved, they were widowed, it was the responsibility of the closest relative to come to their rescue and to buy them back, to pay the price to get them out of slavery or pay off their debt. And we know in the New Testament, this principle is applied to the price that Christ paid with his blood on the cross for all those who would repent and believe. And so again, this psalm was written primarily and specifically about God rescuing the nation of Israel from captivity in Babylon. But it also applies to us as Christians today because God rescuing Israel from exile is a picture, is a type, is a foreshadowing of how he rescued sinners from captivity to sin, death, and hell. So we too are those who have been redeemed. And as we look toward Thanksgiving this week, the one thing we should all be most thankful for is the love that God has shown to us by redeeming us by the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. So, we see first of all the praise for God's loving kindness. Now let's look secondly at the profiles of God's loving kindness. And as a way to stimulate the people of Israel to show their thankfulness to God for his loving kindness, the psalmist painted four vivid profiles or pictures that all illustrate how God rescued them from exile to Babylon. And he compared Israel's deliverance from Babylonian exile to being rescued from four dreadful, disastrous situations. And At the same time, I believe that the Spirit of God who inspired the psalmist to to paint these profiles or pictures intended for us today to recognize ourselves in each one of them. And so look carefully as we go through each one of these four pictures, if you will, um, be on the lookout for yourself. And these four pictures really form the centerpiece of this song. And each of these four pictures have four parts. We'll see there's a predicament, there's a prayer, there's a provision, and then there's praise. So let's look first of all, this first profile or picture is that of wanderers retrieved. Wanderers retrieved in verses four through nine, and the predicament is there in verse four and five. They wandered in the wilderness in a desert region. They did not find a way to an inhabited city. They were hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. And so here the psalmist describes a a group of people who were lost. They were hungry. They were thirsty. They were exhausted. They they couldn't find their way out of the wilderness. They were looking for a a city, a a town, anything where they could get some refuge and some 
some, some supplies, and yet there was no paths, there was no tracks, there was no signs, there was no freeways, there was no supplies, there was no buckies, there was no sonic. I mean, there was nothing. And so they were wandering aimlessly, unable to find their way, and they were on the verge of death. And they realized their hopeless situation. And so what did they do? Verse 6, they prayed. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them out of their distresses. He led them also by a straight way to go to an inhabited city. So they cry out to the Lord. And he delivered them. That's the provision. Verse 7, he led them also by a straight way to go to an inhabited city. So he came out and retrieved them. These people wandering, he said, hey, hey, over here, follow me. And he brought them to a city. It's over, it's over here. This is what you're looking for. And notice how he, they're called to give him thanks. Verse eight, let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness, for his wonders to the sons of men. Why? Because he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. Notice he didn't say, for he has satisfied the thirsty throat or the hungry mouth. This is, this is of the spiritual nature here. That God has satisfied our souls spiritually. He satisfies our thirst, our spiritual thirst. He satisfies our spiritual hunger. So there's wanderers retrieved. Secondly, notice we see prisoners released. Prisoners released in verses 10 through 16. And again, it begins with the predicament in verse 10. There were those who dwelt in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in misery and chains because they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he humbled their heart with labor and they stumbled and there was none to help. So you've got this scene of gloom and despair. Prisoners locked up in chains in some dungeon, ready to die. And they deserve to be there because they had rebelled, it says. They spurned the counsel of the Most High. That word spurn there literally means to push or drive away with the foot. In other words, they punted God's word. We don't, we don't need your word. We don't want your word. And so they, they refused or rejected God's advice or instruction. But they recognized their situation. They were helpless. They were hopeless. They had no other choice but to call out to God, verse 13. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distresses. Notice the answer to prayer. Verse 14, he brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their bonds apart. So he released them from their chains. He goes on in verse 15 to to again call them to an appropriate response. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness, for his wonders to the sons of men. Why? For he has shattered gates of bronze and cut bars of iron asunder. It's like he went in, he broke into the prison and cut them out and brought them out to freedom. So you have wanderers retrieved, prisoners released, and then notice in verse 17 through 22, you have sufferers restored. Sufferers restored and Look at the predicament in verse 17. Fools, because of their rebellious way and because of their iniquities were afflicted, their soul abhorred all kinds of food and they drew near to the gates of death. So the picture here is somebody that is, that is inflicted with some kind of sickness to the point where they've lost their appetite. Um, they're, they're close to death but 
it's their own fault. Notice it says that they're fools because of their rebellious way, because of their iniquities. That's why they were experiencing this particular illness or sickness. It was self-inflicted. But again, they realized how helpless and hopeless they were in and of themselves to do anything, and so they had no other choice but to call out to God for help. Verse 19, then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. Notice the provision there. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. And then again, the call to praise here. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and his wonders to the sons of men. Let them also offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his works with joyful singing. By the way, that's what we are doing. That verse, verse 22, you may want to underline that, highlight that, bracket that. Every time we come together as a church, that's what we're doing. We are offering sacrifices of thanksgiving and telling of his works with joyful singing. Is that what is on your mind? Is that what is in your heart when you come to church on Sundays, when we gather together as God's people, that this is our offering of thanksgiving to him and we are to tell of his works with joyful singing? When we're singing these songs, we're telling uh, ourselves, we're telling one another, we're telling anyone who's here who doesn't know Christ, we're telling them of the works of the Lord. And if we're just kind of mumbling the songs, yeah, Lord, you know, blah, 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 blah. I don't think they're going to be very compelled to, to pursue Christ unless they see people who are truly joyful and thankful. They, what are they so joyful and thankful about? Well, let me tell you what I'm so joyful and thankful about. I think we could grow in this area as a church, right, to be more thankful, more joyful, particularly in the way that we sing. How how do we express this joy? How do we express this thanksgiving? It's through song. So you have wanderers retrieved, you have prisoners released, you have uh, sufferers restored, and finally you have sailors rescued. You have sailors rescued, verse 23, again the predicament, this is more of a lengthy predicament, Uh, Those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they have seen the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he spoke and raised up a stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They rose up to the heavens. They went down to the depths. Their soul melted away in their misery. They reeled and staggered like a drunken man and were at their wit's end. And so the writer here is describing a scene on the ocean, like a little rickety ship on the vast ocean, much like the Mayflower. And that ship was storm-tossed, and the sailors who were there were no novices. They, They had been sailing their entire life, and yet even these Sailing experts were at their wit's end. All their nautical skills were, were of no use. They, 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 their knowledge of sailing was, was, was irrelevant at that point. They were, they, were, they were scared to death. They thought they were going to die. All they could do was stagger around on the deck like a drunk person. And again, they knew the situation was dire. There was, they were desperate. They were helpless. They were hopeless. And so they resorted to the only thing they could And that was to cry out to God, to be merciful, to show uh, them kindness. And they cried to the Lord in their trouble, verse 28, and he brought them out of their distresses. And notice the provision, how he rescued them from the storm. In verse 29, he caused the storm to be still so that the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they were quieted. So he guided them to their desired haven. And then again, the call to praise, verse 31. Then they, uh, for, excuse me, verse 31. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness, for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them extol him also in the congregation of the people and praise him at the seat of the elders. 
Again, all four of these stories are a picture of what being rescued from exile to Babylon was like for the Israelites. But tell me you can't help see yourself in these four pictures. Because these could be likened to scenes of salvation. These are testimonies, if you will. Each of you who know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior could use probably one of these four pictures to describe your salvation story, your testimony, what it was like. Because this is what it's like being rescued from sin. It's like a lost person being found. It's like a prisoner being set free. It's like a a sick person being healed. It's like a sailor caught in a storm who's rescued. I mean, this is the predicament of every one of us apart from Christ. This is our story. This is our predicament. We're all helplessly and hopelessly lost in sin and and, and we are bound by sin and we are infected with sin and we are drowning in sin and guess what? It's our own fault because we deliberately and defiantly rebelled against God by foolishly disobeying his word and we are simply reaping the consequences of our actions but when we do what the people did all four times in this psalm, recognizing our condition is helpless, is hopeless, and we cry out to God for deliverance like they did, God in his great love intervened and he rescued us and he redeemed us, amen? And so there is great hope for all of us in this psalm. Not just for our initial salvation, but also the gradual process of sanctification, which, if your story is like my story, often involves repeated cycles of rebellion, repentance, and restoration. Or maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm the only sinner in here this morning that sometimes struggles with staying on track. I love what William McDonald said in his classic commentary, The Believer's Commentary, which, by the way, if you're looking for a, one, a good one-volume commentary in the whole Bible, that's the one to get. William McDonald, uh, The Believer's Commentary. I think we have some in the Resource Center. Highly, highly recommend it. But this is what he said. Quote, there is a common behavior pattern in the lives, <clears throat> excuse me, in the lives of God's people. First of all, the people stray from the Lord, walking in disobedience to his word. Then they suffer the bitter consequences of their backsliding. When they come to themselves, they cry out to the Lord in confession of sin. He then forgives their sin and brings them back into the place of blessing once more. Do you know that experience? Is that part of your story? He goes on, he said, two basic facts emerge from the contemplation of this ever-recurring cycle. One is the perpetual proneness of the human heart to wander from the living God. We sing about that, Lord, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God of love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. We, we get that. The other thing is the seemingly inexhaustible mercy of the Lord in restoring his people when they come to him in repentance, Amen. All of us are the prodigal son. And if you're like me, there was an initial returning to the father in salvation, but I tend to wander off from time to time. And I need to come back. And the Lord is always there, ready to restore when we come to him with a repentant heart. So we've seen the praise for loving kindness, the profiles of loving kindness, and then lastly, let's just look at the proof of God's loving kindness. 
And this is verses 33 through 43. And after painting these brilliant portraits of the loving kindness of God, the psalmist went on to just give a general summary explanation, if you will, of how God's goodness and loving kindness is confirmed by his sovereignty over all things. That his hand is behind the changing fortunes of of, of men and nations. Notice verse 33, he changes rivers into a wilderness and springs of water into a thirsty ground a fruitful land into a salt waste because of the wickedness of those who dwell in it. And so the psalmist is describing God's discipline on those who are disobedient and how he takes them from prosperity to poverty. But then notice verse 35, he changes a wilderness into a pool of water and a dry land into springs of water and there he makes the hungry to dwell so that they may establish an inhabited city and sow fields and plant vineyards and gather a fruitful harvest. Also he blesses them and they multiply greatly and he does not let their cattle decrease. So now he's talking now about restoring the humble and taking a land that was barren and blessing it and making it very fruitful and productive. And again, a picture, I think, of the Israelites coming back into the promised land and being able to resettle and redevelop the land and live there once again because they had humbled themselves before the Lord. And then notice verse 39, when they, were, when they are diminished and bowed down through oppression, misery, and sorrow, he pours contempt upon princes and makes them wander in a pathless waste Again, just simply talking about how God humbles the proud. Verse 41, but he sets the needy securely on high away from affliction and makes his families like a flock. The upright see it and are glad, but all unrighteousness shuts its mouth. So while God humbles the proud, he restores the upright. We see those who fall from the top to the bottom and those that are lifted from the bottom to the top. And again, I think the general idea here is that all the ups and downs and successes and failures of every nation and every person is caused by and controlled by God. His providence in blessing and exalting the humble and obedient and overthrowing and silencing the proud and disobedient is all evidence, is all proof of his loving kindness. James Montgomery Boyce has a stellar three-volume commentary on the Psalms. Again, I'd recommend that as well. Uh, If you want a a commentary specifically on the Psalms. But this is what he says here. He said, the Psalm ends with a humble acknowledgement of God's sovereignty over all things and all circumstances, reminding us that even the bad things of life are in God's hands. Life has its pains and tragedies even for Christians, yet in spite of them, we can and should praise God for his wisdom and goodness. We can do this by seeing God's wise, loving, and sovereign hand even in hardships. And then he ends with this sentence. He says, God loves us, and because he does, he comforts us, he preserves us, and he brings us through even the hardest experiences of our lives. You might be going through a hard time right now. In fact, you may be facing the most difficult, hardest experience you've ever faced in your life right now. And as we approach Thanksgiving, you might be struggling to see anything good right now for which to be thankful And this psalm should remind you that you are in the hands of a sovereign, all-wise, loving God. And his love for you is unchanging. His love for you is unwavering. It's unending. And whatever it is that you are faced with, whatever it is you are battling with, it is an expression of God's love for you.
Notice the last verse, verse 43, the conclusion to this song. Who is wise? Let him give heed to these things and consider the loving kindness of the Lord. The psalmist says, listen, if you're wise, you'll pay close attention to what you've just heard. And you'll consider, you'll ponder, you'll think about, you'll dwell upon God's loving kindness towards you personally. Or said another way, only a fool would walk away from this psalm without being moved to some response after listening to what's been said. Listen, God's loving kindness demands a response. And as we allow our minds to fill up with all the ways that God has demonstrated his loving kindness to us, our lips should gush forth with praise and thanksgiving and our lives should be given wholly to him as a living sacrifice set apart to honor and serve him out of a grateful heart. As I was going over my notes early this morning in our walk-in closet, because that's where I study, and my wife popped in and said good morning, and said good morning, and then she went out, and she came back in again, and she kind of was just standing there, and I could kind of sense her presence, and I turned, and she had her little iPad out, and I knew she'd been reading Spurgeon, because that's where she reads morning and evening, every morning and evening, and uh, she's very faithful uh, to read those devotions, and uh, she's constantly sharing them with me and our family, uh, what she's read and how she's been moved by something that Spurgeon wrote, and so she said, I got to share with you what I just read, knowing that I was going to preach, be preaching on Psalm 107, and so she read it to me, and I was like, oh, thank you, I just got my closing illustration, Spurgeon this morning, and some of you may have already read it, he was focusing in on Lamentations 3, verse 58, which says, O Lord, you have pleaded my soul's cause, you have redeemed my life. And this was what he said, and I quote, a grateful spirit should ever be cultivated by the Christian, and especially after deliverances, we should prepare a song for our God. Earth should be a temple filled with the songs of grateful saints and every day should be a censer smoking with the sweet incense of thanksgiving. He says, O children of God, seek after a vital experience of the Lord's loving kindness and when you have it, speak positively of it, sing gratefully and shout triumphantly. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your unchanging, unfailing, unending love for us. And we see your love highlighted more than any other place, more than any other time than on the cross. When you demonstrated your love for us in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. And as we consider that and contemplate that this week, may our hearts be stirred to give you thanks, not just for our many temporal blessings, which are many, not for the food and clothes and houses and cars and friendships and all the things that we enjoy and that are gifts from your hand of love, but ultimately our salvation that that would be the thing that we're most thankful for, that we talk about the most this week with others. And Lord, for those who may be interacting with unbelieving family members or, or coworkers or friends this week around the table, sometimes that's a very awkward situation to, to share the gospel with moms and dads and brothers and sisters and cousins and nephews and but Lord, no better place than, than a thanksgiving to talk about how thankful we are for our salvation in Christ and for the gospel. And so would you give us a winsomeness and a boldness 
to share the good news of salvation in Christ with great joy and thankfulness. And we'll give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.